Good morning and thank you for joining us as we continue our Lenten journey of stones on this Palm Sunday. And I'll be sharing from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 29 to 40. But let us pray. Open our eyes, Lord, to your coming. Open our ears, Lord, to your word. Open our hearts, Lord, to your love. In the precious name of Jesus of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. When trying to imagine the scene that unfolded when Jesus rode into Jerusalem more than 2,000 years ago, reminded me of the triumphant Springbok rugby team's victory tours across South Africa after winning the World Cup rugby. The emotions of the crowds who lined the streets waiting for the champions of the world, and then the deafening cheers and adulation from the exuberant fans shouting and screaming and celebrating, waving flags and banners, vuvuzelas exploding. It was quite incredible, the expression of pride and joy as their heroes arrived. And I think it must have been just this way in Jerusalem the day Jesus arrived. After three years of teaching and preaching and helping and healing, Jesus arrives in the city of Jerusalem and there he is met by the crowds shouting and praising. Instead of flags, banners and vuvuzelas, the crowds in Jerusalem threw their cloaks on the ground and waved palm branches. Let us understand that as Jesus climbed up onto the, that donkey, the Jewish people thought their prayers going back generation after generation were being answered. They had been waiting and expecting the promised Messiah to appear. Constantly they had looked for signs given by God through the prophets which would declare the arrival of their Savior, come to lead them to freedom. More than 500 years before Christ, the prophet Zechariah foretold the Palm Sunday event, saying, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, daughter of Jerusalem! See your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Their longing was an unending cry, even as Jesus climbed onto the donkey's back. The longing of the people for their Messiah was almost a tangible thing. Jerusalem was packed with people from near and far, come to celebrate the feast of the Passover. Again, they would reenact and remember their deliverance from Egypt. There's an expectant atmosphere, a festive air. The eternal hope of the new kingdom had already begun to flicker in the hearts of many because of the past events from the previous three years. The hopes of countless generations can be contained no longer. They shout out the ancient cry of homage bestowed only on God's anointed one. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Running before him, they throw garments upon the ground, covering his way with palms, waving branches in celebration, in relief, in defiance even. You can imagine them almost moving as one in adoration. The crowds welcoming Jesus have not only heard about their miracles, they are eyewitnesses. The blind, to whom Jesus had restored sight, leading the way. The mute, whose tongues Jesus had loosed, shouting the loudest. The cripples, whom Jesus has healed, bound and leapt for joy. The lepers, whom Jesus had cleansed, spread their new untainted garments in his path, hailing him, the King of glory. Widows and orphans are there. Those raised from death itself rejoice before their King. And of course, on the sideline of these gatherings, there will always be those who are concerned with public order. It was the case even as Jesus entered Jerusalem. A group of Pharisees approached him and said, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And the language that they used was very strong. In fact, they said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. 
In other words, not only make them stop, but tell them what, what they are saying is wrong. Now we know that the religious leaders were at that time looking for a way that they might bring Jesus down. In addition, it was not safe to have such commotion <laughs> under the rule of the Romans. Soldiers might mistake the impromptu parade and the shouts as the beginnings of a dangerous mob or even a political uprising. In either case, the Pharisees wanted Jesus to stop the commotion. And Jesus' response was immediate. If these people were silent, the stones would cry out. Now the Pharisees had heard that phrase before in the words of the prophet Habakkuk, who condemns those who gather power and wealth to themselves by evil ways and at the expense of others. Habakkuk says that judgment will come even from their homes, for the stones will cry out from the wall and the beams from the woodwork will echo it. Habakkuk 2 verse 11. So when Jesus said if the crowds were silenced, the stones would cry out, they knew what he meant. Jesus is essentially saying that the significance of their arrival in Jerusalem and the proclamation of his kingdom is so profound that even if his disciples were to be silenced, the very stones would cry out in acknowledgement of his divine authority of who Jesus is. Jesus was stating the truth that the phrases of God in Jesus Christ cannot be silenced. The disciples were giving glory to Jesus because he was the promised one from God. And the Pharisees refused to recognize who Christ was. Our world is familiar with this concept of glory. We give glory and praise to athletes, to actors, to musicians, authors, scientists, politicians, and many others. Glory is an idea of greatness that we give much too easily these days. It is a distinction that one is better than the rest because of their ability or their achievements or because of who they are. It is the idea of unequaled greatness. But even the greatest athletes of the world were created by God. Musicians perform beautifully, but God created music itself and is the one who puts a song in our hearts. The politicians lead nations, but in the end, every nation will bow to Jesus Christ. Authors write words and books, but Jesus Christ is the word of God. He is the author of salvation. Even scientists in their greatest discovery have only found out what God had already put in place when the world began. If we choose not to give God glory, even the stones will cry out. He is of infinite worth. There is no other name that will ring throughout the halls of heaven for eternity except the name of Jesus Christ. The names that our world exalts will be forgotten and fade into the past, but the name of Jesus will resound forever. The praises of God's people cannot be silenced. Jesus accepted the shouts of the people with humility, but change did not come. He was not crowned the king, he was not recognized as the Messiah, the one come to save. Jesus died and then there was silence. His disciples scattered. There was no more shouts for a king to come to save. And followers laid his body in a tomb carved into rock. A stone, a silent stone was rolled across the opening. But we know what happened. The stone did not remain still and Jesus did not remain silent. He rose from the dead and said to his followers, peace be with you. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And if the people are silenced, even the stones will cry out. 
Jesus proclaimed a reign where all people are treated with compassion and fairness, where our neighbors are not limited to those who look the same as we do, who speak the same language, have the same income, or even practice the same faith religion. Our neighbors stretch out around the globe, encompassing all people. Jesus taught a way by which we can give glory to God through our worship, our love, and our witness. And when it comes to standing up for what is right, living out the possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation and, and proclaiming the works of Jesus Christ, we cannot remain silent. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, the followers of Jesus Christ cannot remain silent. And if there's anyone or anything that would silence us, we'll be like the stones crying out. In the face of injustices, of racism, sexism and prejudice, we do not remain silent. When, when a people are forgotten or dehumanized because of their ethnicity, age or economic status, we do not remain silent. When we encounter those in need of comfort and companionship, we give it. When we can offer the hope of transformation through Jesus Christ, we do not remain silent. When we witness our faith to others, when we can tell the story of Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection for all people, we speak as Jesus asks us to. John Stott, a great communicator of Christian truth, wrote a book titled Our Guilty Silence, where he focuses on the idea that the church has withheld the gospel from the world. He goes on to say that we have not proclaimed the great, marvelous, delivering, liberating truth which is inherent in the good news of Jesus Christ. And because we have failed to evangelize, John Stott says we are guilty. Our silence has condemned men and women to death, misery and darkness. Too often we have come to believe that God's grace is a private, personal matter and shouldn't be expressed in public. We have become silent about Jesus Christ. How many times have we had the opportunity to tell someone about God's forgiveness, about his grace and his love, yet we remain silent? What about the times that we have wanted to say to someone, may I pray with you? Or I will pray for you. And instead we say nothing. How often do we consider inviting a friend, a colleague or a neighbor to church, but then chicken out at the last minute? What about being advocates for social justice issues? Let us speak out against oppression, discrimination and inequality and work towards positive change in the world. So what will we do? Will we join those believers throughout history whose voices and lives have, testifi has, have testified to the ultimate glory of God? Or will we choose to live lives that exalt everything else in our world? Will our voices and our lives glorify God? Or will the stones need to cry out because of our silence? Are we ready to make the conscious decision not to be silent, to complete this Lenten journey and enter the celebration of Easter, proclaiming new life in Jesus Christ? The stones you were given as you entered this morning, if you are in church with us, represent our silence. All those times we could have spoken a word of grace, all those times when we could have shared God's abundant and unfailing love with others, but did not. And as we lay them at the cross of Christ, may our passion come alive. May our love for the Savior become known to all. Then the stones can be silent and we can sing praise. Amen.